the Iraq War was a an important turning point in history. You have to remember that 84% of Europeans, when they were polled by Time magazine, 300,000 Europeans were polled. 84% said the United States is the biggest threat to world peace. 9% thought Iraq was the biggest threat to world peace. So there were massive demonstrations, large demonstrations in the U.S., but 3 million people turned out in Rome against the U.S. invasion. Massive demonstrations across Europe because the world saw that the United States was creating, fabricating a pretext to invade a sovereign country. We have to put this in a little bit of context. The Americans have been obsessed with Iraq for some time, a certain faction of Americans led by Paul Wolfowitz. And Wolfowitz was writing about the need to overthrow the government in Iraq back in 1979. When he gathered his supporters, his supporters were the other neocons. It was Libby and Fife and Hadley and Richard Pearl. They were called by the New York Times the Wolfowitz Cabal. And their obsession was Iraq. We could go back to 1997 when the neocons found the project for a new American century. Th their main focus from the very beginning was not only reestablishing US global hegemony, as if somehow the United States wasn't already the world's hegemonic power, their obsession was Iraq. And from the beginning they said, we've got to overthrow the government of Saddam Hussein. Uh, in, they, they issued a report titled, rebuilding America's defenses. And that's the famous one in which they say we can't expand America's defenses as quickly as we would like without a new Pearl Harbor. Well, they got their new Pearl Harbor on September 11th, 2001, with the Al-Qaeda bombing of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon with the, uh, the hijackings. It's fascinating to look at the response to that. Immediately, the focus was not on Al-Qaeda, even though we knew that bin Laden and his people were behind this. Anybody who knew anything knew that they'd been planning these things for some time, and they were. this was their goal to pull this off, and they managed to do so. But from the very beginning, the Bush administration, Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Condoleezza Rice, Wolfowitz, his whole crew were focused on Iraq. So the first day, September 12th, because Bush didn't get there right away. So Bush finally gets there on September 12th. And he says to Richard Clark, the counterterrorism chief in the United States, said, see what see what Saddam's role in this was. See if Iraq did this. And Richard Clark says, Iraq? It was Al Qaeda. What are you talking about? But right from the beginning, the die was cast. And we heard it from George Tenet the CIA director, and Rumsfeld. Rumsfeld says, well, there aren't any good targets in Afghanistan. Let's bomb Iraq instead. And, and the people who were sane, like Colin Powell, temporarily, uh, Richard Clark, and some of the others, thought that, th that they were using 9-11 as a pretext to go after what they really wanted to go after. They didn't care about Afghanistan and Al Qaeda. That was a distraction, just like Ukraine is a distraction for going after China. Uh, Al-Qaeda was a distraction for going after Iraq, which is what they really wanted. And so they began the planning from the very beginning. In fact, at the first National Security Council meeting that Bush had, uh, he turns to Condoleezza Rice, the National Security Advisor, and said, well, what's on the, on the agenda? And she said, going after Iraq. Paul O'Neill, the Secretary of the Treasury, not the New York Yankees baseball player, Paul O'Neill. Um, Paul O'Neill said that from the very beginning, as soon as they took over, they were making plans to invade Iraq. And so it took them two years before they could actually get to that because they had some other things interrupt them. But they were planning on doing this all along. Uh, and But the pretext that they used was this idea that Iraq was developing weapons of mass destruction, going against the UN resolution after the first Gulf War, when we destroyed 
uh, the Iraqi military. After that, Iraq destroyed its weapons of mass production. And we knew this from a lot of sources. However, the UN sent inspectors into Iraq and they kept on looking at all the sites and they could not turn up a single weapon of mass destruction. Hans Blix, the chief UN weapons inspector, said the CIA keeps giving us these lists. But we go there. We've done more than 500 inspections. How could they be 100 percent sure that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction and zero percent sure of where they are? Because we go in every place they say and there's nothing there. And in fact, uh, Saddam Hussein's son-in-law, who was in charge of the weapons systems, progress, weapons of mass destruction, came over here, defected in 1995, and he gave such extensive information about Iraq's destruction of its weapons of mass destruction, people said it was embarrassing, the details. Then Iraq put out, I think it's a 12,000, a huge report uh, detailing how they destroyed all the weapons of mass destruction. And it looked like this was working because the weapons inspectors are saying this. Scott Ritter and other U.S. weapons inspectors are saying this is bullshit. Uh, and then it was at that point that Bush pulled out his ace in the hole and he sent Colin Powell to the United Nations. He said, you've got the most credibility of anybody in this administration. You've got to do it. And Powell was getting these reports from Libby and Tennant and others, uh, and, and he was rejecting a lot of their information. But he went before the United Nations and he talked about, he showed a, held up a vial of anthrax and he talked about the mobile weapons labs. One lie, one fabrication after another. Powell later admitted this was a low point in his diplomatic career and his life in some ways, although he had a few of those. Uh, but uh, the support in the United States for a U.S. invasion of Iraq went from 33 percent to 50 percent overnight because of Powell's presentation. And he says, I've got facts. We've got evidence to support every claim I'm going to make one lie after another. Uh, but also the other person who pulled uh, Bush's bacon out of the fire there was Tony Blair, who was known as Bush's poodle. And Blair came up with equally f fantastic reports based on phony intelligence about the weapons of mass destruction. But Blair said, we've got to go to the United Nations. He said, I need more cover. We've got to go to the United Nations and get the United Nations resolution for uh, approving this. And so they, they had some of the votes but what happened was they were not only surveilling, not only uh, eavesdropping on people, they're putting tremendous pressure on a lot of governments to support the war resolution. The way we know that is a wonderful British intelligence official, Catherine Gunn, who had the guts uh, to risk her career uh, to expose this uh, to the world. And, and did so and risked so much in order to try to stop the U.S. invasion. She's one of the, the heroes of this story. And I did a couple of events with her that I'm very proud of. Uh, but Catherine exposed you know, the, what the British were doing, what the Americans were doing uh, in terms of strong arming the world to support an invasion based on totally false pretenses and then the U.S. goes in there and levels Iraq, uh, even though there was a lot of opposition in the military, a lot of opposition among diplomats, even in the intelligence community. Uh, the, the, the opposition was enormous, but the media was totally lapdog as they usually are. You look at the American media today. It was the same thing then. They didn't learn the lesson. There was only one person on primetime me mainstream media who was criticizing the plans for U.S. invasion, Phil Donahue. And Donahue was fired by MSNBC. They said all the other networks are cheerleading the war. How can we be the one outlier having a primetime show by a leading well-respected journalist criticizing U.S. plans for an invasion? And not only did they all support it, they brought on general and admiral after general and admiral. And we later found out they were being paid. 
We later found out they were getting daily briefings from the Pentagon. They were getting marching orders from the Pentagon on the lies to spread. Later, many of them were humiliated. They were also all, these were former military people who were working for the defense, con they were called defense contractors, they're really merchants of war, uh, death contractors. And, and so this was such, and, and, and the Democrats who knew better did not have the guts to stand up to Bush once the war fever was spreading. When they voted in the House and in the Senate, in the Senate, only one Republican voted against the war measure, and that was Lincoln Chafee of Rhode Island. And he spoke out after, and he said it was obscene. It was sickening to see the Democrats march down to the White House every day and get briefed by the White House and come back and support this war. He said it was a disgusting spectacle. And then the U.S. invades. And we think we're going to be greeted as liberators. We think it's going to be a cakewalk, like Putin in uh, Kiev, thinking that this invasion was going to be a cakewalk. And of course it wasn't. And there were a lot of American officials and military people and intelligence people who understood what we were getting into. And they warned we we're going to ignite a we're going to ignite a sectarian war between the Sunnis and the Shiites, which we did. And they say. We're going to turn Iraq into the jihadi Super Bowl, which we did. They came from all over the world to support the anti-American forces in Iraq. We said we're going to give new life to Al Qaeda, which we did, and created a disaster there that went on for years, uh, and w with all the torture and the the renditions. You know, a lot of that CIA torture after 9-11 was because we were desperate, the US was desperate to find ties between Saddam Hussein and 9-11. And we were torturing people all over the world because there were no such ties. And what, did Cheney buy that? Did Bush buy that? No, just the opposite. And, and so, and the other thing that we should mention, that one of the initial names for this was not Operation Iraqi Freedom, it was Operation Iraqi Liberation. But then they realized the acronym was OIL, and they couldn't do that, <laughs> because what was the real reason? Why did we care about Iraq? Because it sat on top of 10% or more of the world's oil reserves. And Cheney and Bush were oil men, and Condoleezza Rice had a a, a big oil ship name, named after her. Uh, and so they start to scare people. And they say that we don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud. Condoleezza Rice says that, Bush says that, that's the kind of mantra. Uh, whereas there were all these other countries that we knew had weapons of mass destruction, from Israel to Syria and everybody in between, but Iraq didn't have weapons of mass destruction. We go in there, we can't find anything. We go in there, there's total chaos. Uh, and, and so the people who said this is America's great shining moment, within a couple of years were saying this is a disaster. Even Charles Cranhammer, who had said, first talked about the America's unipolar moment and America's unipolar era by 2006, he says, well, the game is up. <laughs> American unipolarity has seen its best days already and it's going downhill now. Uh, and as Abu uh, Musa, the head of the Arab League says, uh, the gates of hell are open in Iraq in 2006. It was a disaster, but it was a disaster of America's own making. And the world knew the United States then as the greatest warmonger. In 2019, uh, Jimmy Carter, who's now in hospice care, great ex-president, terrible president, but a great ex-president. Jimmy Carter said in 2019 that the United States has been around for 242 years. He said in that time, we've had 16 years we were not at war. He said we're the greatest warmonger in the history of the world. And that's sad. And in 2003 and 2006, 2012, you know, the world knew that. But somehow we've got amnesia. So we forgot all the American invasions and we can rally the world as this great moral force against the Russian invasion, which should be condemned, but it should be condemned in the context of understanding what's gone on in the world for the past 32 years.